Hi, um, today I'd like to discuss about normal and abnormal growth in pediatrics. This is the first video lecture of the series that would accompany the academic half day. The first session will be on April 22nd. So I hope you all have a chance to review this video before the session. So before we talked about abnormal growth, we have to understand normal growth. So the most important tool, as we all know, in evaluating a patient with growth problem is the growth chart. So we have to understand and be able to interpret the growth data in order for us to accurately evaluate a patient with growth problem. So many of you have seen this growth chart and feel very intimidated by it because it has a lot of lines, numbers, right? And it can look very intimidating at times. So today I'd like to discuss about the basics of these growth chart. Many of you already know that there are two main sources of growth chart. One is from CDC, the other one is from WHO. CDC survey children across ethnicities in the United States at different age groups. And they come up with a growth chart that is used mostly in the United States. WHO, on the, on the other hand, they have survey the children um, throughout the world and with cross uh, multi-ethnicities and have data. So for me, I think the most appropriate growth chart to be used in the United States would be CDC. It already has the ethnic diversity in it. So when you see a growth chart, think of it as statistics. Remember your statistic course in college. So when you have enough data, you'll see the data that would have a normal distribution. So you have somebody at 50th percentile, which is considered a z-score of zero. And you have someone who's at the 95th percentile, which will be considered plus two SD. And then there are children who has who are at fifth percentile or third percentile, which is between 95th and 97th percentile. So if I flip this chart so that the 95th percentile is on top and the third percentile is on the bottom, you're gonna have something that looks like this. And then at every age group, you do the same thing. You flip the graph, and you start connecting the 50th percentile, the 95th percentile, and the 5th percentile. So you're gonna get a line, right, for the 95th, the 5th, and the 50th percentile. So this is your growth chart. It starts to look like the line that you're seeing on a growth chart. However, it is not as that, not as easy because we don't grow constantly. So if we all grow at a constant rate, the growth, the growth chart will just look like straight line. But in reality, we don't grow like that. So if you look at this graph again, you see that there are there is a period where you grow constantly. And then there's a period you grow very fast and then you plateau out. So this corresponds to your pubertal development. So this is where you have the pubertal growth spurt. And this is where your puberty completes. So you're gonna have a slowdown in growth and then you plateau. So that's the human growth pattern. Again, to reiterate, you have the fastest growth in the first year of life. This is a very, the fastest period of growth. You don't have this growth velocity this fast ever again. So on the average, we grow 12 to 15 centimeters, centimeters per year in the first year. This is why when you do a nursery, there is a formula saying that um, an infant should double the growth, the length by four months of age. And then you slow down after two years of life. And then there's a period where there is a very steady growth rate. So you remember that a very straight line on that growth chart. And then there is an acceleration during puberty, 
reaching the pubertal growth spurt, and then you plateau after puberty complete. So this is the human growth pattern. So if I plot the height velocity against the age, you're gonna see a graph that looks like this. So you see what, what those lines are, right? So there is a distribution of growth velocity. There is a third percentile, 97th percentile, very similar, but the graph looks different. So what, what, what are they? So remember the growth pattern, that you have a very rapid growth in the first two years, and then you slow down, right? And you have a plateau period. So if you see the growth velocity during childhood, this line hovers between four centimeters to five centimeters per year. So that comes the magic number that we say in a prepubertal child, the cutoff for a subnormal growth is between four to five centimeters per year. So if you see a patient that has been growing less than 45 centimeters per year, um, during the prepubertal period, that's considered abnormal. And then you have a period of pubertal growth spurt. So you're going to see a peak that looks like this, and then you slow down. So what are these two lines? So these two dotted lines represent children who have precocious puberty. So the graph shift to the left. And there's a um, for children who have delayed puberty. So the graph shift to the right. So it corresponding to the timing of their growth spurt in relationship to their puberty. The, this peak growth spurt occurs at your mid puberty. So between 10 or three to four. So these, this is the graph for boys. So what do you think about girls? Would it shift to the left or shift to the right? It would shift to the left, right? Because girls usually have um, a sooner pubertal development, right? So they start developing on the average two years before boys. So the graph would shift to the left. And you still have the two dotted lines, right? The one shift to the left with precocious puberty and the one that shift to the right for girls with delayed puberty. So this is the height velocity plotting against age. Actually, this graph um, already exists in EPIC. So many of you um, who has done endocrine rotation, I have already shown you the graph that can be used to compare the growth velocity. So when you see a patient with growth concern, what should we do? So I like to um, stress the importance of going back to the basic, right? So we need to review history, like a very detailed history, um, family history, birth history, and any important medical history that may, con that may cause slow growth. And then we need to do a complete physical exam, including pubertal exam. Why? Because as you see from the previous graph, a child who is at early stage of puberty would not, re would not, be, would not have the same um, growth velocity as a child who is more advanced in puberty. So it's very important that you um, do a complete physical exam. And then you determine the height percentile. Again, go back to the statistics. Being the third percentile does not mean that this is abnormal. Why? Because statistically speaking, if you're on the third percentile, there are 3% of normal children that are shorter than you. And then after you determine the height percentile, then you calculate growth velocity. And if it does not look right, I always say, like, if it does not look right, remeasure it. And this um, picture show a correct posture for height measurement. There is a name 
um, it's called Frankfurt plane. So you must have eye and ears in the same plane, right? And a vortex on top. So again, if you have a graph that does not look right, or there's a height measurement that does not look right, remeasure. This is another fancy machine. It's called Harpenden Stadiometer. So this is a very um, accurate measurement for height. And as you can see that examiner um, does a very proper technique. So how to calculate growth velocity? It is a very, very simple mathematical calculation. For example, this patient, you're seeing a 10 year and one month old boy whose height is 140 centimeters. And you were able to compare with his previous height at eight years and two months, his height was 131 centimeters. So what is current, his current height velocity? So he grew a total of nine centimeters over its period of 23 months. So nine divided by 23 times 12. So you get a growth velocity per year. So this will be 4.7 centimeters per year. So this is the growth velocity. Once you have the number, then you can compare to the um, normal distribution of growth velocity. Remember that we talked about like that. This is a pre-pubertal boy. So a four centimeters, 4.7 centimeters per year. Sounds normal. And then there's also another measurement that we always come up, um, we always calculate. It's called mid-parental target height. So it is an estimation. Um, it's by no means an, an accurate estimation at all. So it is a benchmark for your genetic potential in order for you to determine whether is this patient going to have a height that is appropriate for family or not. So the formula is the average between father's height and mother's height, but there's a difference of five inches between male and female. So for example, for boys, you would have to add five inches to mother's height and do the average of those to adjusted height. But for girls, you would subtract five inches from father's height. So, or centimeters, it's 13 centimeters. For example, if this patient's father is 5'10 and mom is 5'5, five five, right? So you add five inches to mom's height and then average it out. So his mid parental target height would be 5'10. So now you wanna put everything together. So you have two plots, you have the growth velocity, you have the mid parental target height. So now you could say that this patient seems to have a pretty normal growth velocity. Right? His growth height percentile is in a normal percentile, he has normal growth velocity, and he's in keeping with mid parental height. So this is an example of how you can easily determine whether is this patient um, have a normal growth or not, right? And there's also another way, a quick way of um, determine if there is a growth problem, right? So if a patient is tracking along the same percentile, you can assume that the growth velocity is normal. What does that say? So that means that you can have a child that his growth has been tracking along the third percentile, and that's totally normal. But if there is a decline in height percentile, right, this is something that um, many of you have used, and I think it's a very quick way of determining whether this patient has normal growth velocity or not, right? So if there is a decline in height percentile, then when you calculate the growth velocity, it is often subnormal. But when in doubt, always do the calculation, do the math. It's a very simple mathematical formula. So when we talked about etiologies of poor growth, I often think of growth as a very broad um, concern because there are so many systems that can cause growth problem. For example, you could see a child with cystic fibrosis, right? They have growth failure. 
You can have a patient with chronic kidney disease. They often have very poor growth or um, GI, such as inflammatory bowel disease or chronic liver disease. So many of these chronic disease would affect growth. So you might want to elicit that in the history. Next is genetic disorders. Right? The most common chromosomal abnormalities that cause short stature is Down syndrome, right? trisomy 21, or inborn errors of metabolism or skeletal dysplasia. This is an example of Down syndrome growth chart. You could see that the gray area is the area for normal children, and these lines represent Down syndrome. So you could see that um, they are below the average. Most of them are always smaller than normal children. Interestingly, their weight doesn't seem to be um, quite far off. So this is why many of Down syndrome has obesity and um, at risk for also for diabetes. There are many specific growth charts for different disorders. There is one for Turner syndrome, there's one for achondroplasia, there's one for Russell Silver. So you wanna make sure that if there is a specific growth chart for that syndrome, you wanna compare using that growth chart for that syndrome to compare whether the height for that patient is normal or not. Now here comes the endocrine disorders that can cause poor growth. Basically almost everything in endocrine can result in poor growth. The common, common ones are hypothyroid or patients with um, delayed puberty. And after excluding everything else, then we do often do a specific test for growth hormone to diagnose growth hormone deficiency. Because if the patient is growth hormone deficient, then that patient will be eligible for growth hormone treatment. So I'd like you to also review several syndromes that have short stature as a main feature. Often, it, they're often come out on your board exam uh, one common one example is Turner syndrome. So remember, there are different chromosomal abnormalities, 45X being the most common. There are also mosaic Turner, there's ring chromosome, and there's also isochromosome X of the long arm. So you're missing the short arms of X chromosomes. So make sure that you review prominent features. Turner syndrome has many organ involvements, so you want to make sure that you review all of them, especially cardiovascular and the endocrine system. Right? So they often have delayed puberty in a form or primary gonadal failure. So we'll come back to talk about this um, in the second video about puberty. And very similar to Turner syndrome is Noonan syndrome, but it can also occurs in 46 XY individual. So make sure that you review prominent features. Cardiovascular system, um, the abnormalities seen in Noonan's are often different than Turner. Right? So they have pulmonic valve stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And for endocrine system, um, short stature is also the main feature. And as you can see, they also have webbed neck, which is very similar to Turner syndrome. And the last one, Prader-Willi. So um, this syndrome is caused by the imprinting defect in 15Q. Make sure that you review prominent features. Right? One of the common features is that they have hypotonia and very poor feeding during infancy. And it later is developed hyperphagia, right, the opposite, and become obese and during childhood and adolescence. And they often have mental retardation. So for endocrine system, they have short stature, obesity, and delayed puberty as main features. <clears throat> and the last one, achondroplasia, which is the most common skeletal dysplasia. Um, you want to make you want to you want to make sure that you review all the prominent features, skeletal features. Right? So they're extremely short 
on the average, minus four to minus five standard deviation. They have short limbs, but have normal IQ. Okay, for this patient, um, he's actually an orthopedic surgeon, but also has achondroplasia. So um, this is all I want to review for now. Um, we are going to do cases during the academic half day. So um, you want to uh, make sure that you review all the syndromes that I suggest so it will make the session goes very smoothly. Thank you for listening.